Well, welcome to another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. My name is Mark Powell and I'm the convener for the National Journal of the Presbyterian Church of Australia, AP. And today my special guest is Mrs. Heather Greatbatch. And we're going to be talking about the heavy privilege of caring for elderly parents. Heather, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Great to be here. Now, Heather, the first question I always ask all of my guests is, I think in some ways the most important one, and that is, tell us uh, in your own words, how you became a Christian? Oh, I was definitely brought up in a Christian home. My parents were both really strong believers. Uh, they came over from Northern Ireland to Australia to get into the ministry. And so they had that, that um, mindset before they actually even arrived in Australia. Uh, Dad trained under John G. Ridley to be an evangelist. So uh, he was a leading evangelist at the time, uh, Mr. Ridley, and Dad learnt well under him. Uh, so I knew from a very young age that I wasn't a Christian. Um, and because I grew up in a Christian home, I knew that I wasn't a believer. I could see Christians around me and knew that I didn't have the peace and the joy and the love for others mm. that they had in their lives. So, but I was a stubborn little coot. So between the ages of about six and nine, I knew where I stood with God, but I didn't do anything about it because I was very self-righteous and thought, you know, I'm doing well, nothing wrong with me. God wouldn't particularly say no to me. Um, anyway, uh, the Lord didn't let go of me. So between home and church, I was surrounded by uh, conviction, but also at school because the Lord arranged it that there was an evangelist wife who had come out from uh, America. Jean Jeffries was his name and Rose Jeffries was my teacher at school. And every Friday afternoon, she used to get the kids in a corner and teach them about a segment of Pilgrim's Progress and always leave Christian in some precarious position so that the next week you'd be interested to hear how God got him out of that. And so I was not just convicted at home and at church, but also at school. So the Lord had his gracious hand on me uh, to show me where I stood with him uh, very early in my life. So, uh, it, but it wasn't until the Billy Graham crusade in 1968 that I really uh, made a commitment to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So 1968, we're not going to try and guess your age. You were very, very young by then. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Toddler, toddler yeah, in right, 1968. Yeah. It's good that they allowed toddlers to go to the Billy Graham. It is home. kind of, they yes. Must have yeah. walked out of the creche, did you? Uh, oh, oh, definitely, right. definitely. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, the love and the joy in your home, because I think mm. many would have, particularly from the world, this stereotype that particularly the evangelist's home was austere and strict and serious. Um, can you describe, you know, something of what it was like to grow up as a, as a pastor's kid and particularly a dad that had trained as an evangelist? Sure. Um, well, basically on Sunday, before I became a Christian, I felt like dad it was really God, was dangling me over the cliff of self-righteousness, mm. showing me that if I kept going in this way, I was heading to a lost eternity. So, uh, but I loved my dad. And mm. even as a child, even without um, being a Christian at that stage, I knew there was something special about him. And it was a selflessness that he had. Uh, that really appealed to me. There was something about Dad that really uh, stood out as being worlds different to me at that time. Can you give me some concrete examples of his selflessness? Yeah, he used to uh, uh, help people uh, and his, his way of evangelism was like practical evangelism as well as just speaking. He would actually be, for instance, when he came to us to pick us up at school, he would often be covered in concrete dust or <laughs> or dirt or something where he'd actually gone out to help a neighbour who was in distress or uh, had washed cars for someone who needed it done. So he got alongside people, much like a pastor I know, got, got alongside people and actually got to know them 
Uh, and I think Dad realised that in Australia especially, you have to prove yourself to people before they'll listen to you. Uh, when, he, when he decided to come to Australia, his pastor in, in that farewell from Northern Ireland said, I hope you realise, John, you're going to one of the hardest mission fields in the world uh, mm. because we have so much in Australia we think we can live without God. So, mm. so Dad had a real selflessness about him and I think, too, he had priority. He put God's word as a priority in his life. Mm. And so he knew God's word almost back to front. You, know, you could ask him a question and he'd think of you know, uh, text straight away that would help. And one text that reminds me of Dad was that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm. And Dad used to have his own John Farr version of that in I can do, I can be, and I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because Dad wasn't just a pastor and a father, he was also mum's primary carer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you explain a little bit about that? How how did he become that? What happened to your mother? Yeah. That, he, that you know, she needed his help 24-7? Yeah. Um, mum was ill before I was even born. Uh, she got septicemia at my second brother's birth mm. and as a result of that became very unwell. Uh, and when she was pregnant with me, she was told by her GP that she should have me aborted in order that she may be able to raise her other three children. Mm. So it was basically in his eyes a life and death decision that she keep going with me and Thank the Lord she did. Mm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here to talk to you today, Mark. Mm. Uh, so she was a lady of courage, uh, but she she also was a lady of endurance because she really had so many different ailments that God really gave her a ministry through sickness, which is a rather lonely mm. type of ministry to have and a, a tough one, but mum whenever she went into hospital because she had various cancers like renal cancer and um, and uh, breast cancer and a few other you know, sort of debilitating diseases like fibromyalgia and things mm. like that you know things that uh, are really tough to cope with um, and she would be in hospital quite often I think she had 17 operations in her life and mm. some of those were quite major so uh she was a lady who used to take the opportunity to talk to people in the beds beside her about mm. her faith or talk to the uh, nursing staff. Mm. You know? And that was a wonderful gift that she gave to others mm. through her own personal um, struggles with So it's incredible diseases. why the doctor in, uh, advises your father to abort mm. the pregnancy, which would have been you, yeah, would have been um, to save your mother. Um, mm -hmm. They don't. Yep. Um, you survive yep. um, <laughs> and, and are still going strong. Uh, <laughs> your mother, uh, how long did she survive for after the birth? And oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mum actually died at the age of 85. Mm. Uh, so she... Uh, ha ironically outlived two urologists who told her she only had months to live wow. and one GP. And wow. ironically, it was a GP who said that she was thinking that she was ill. Rather, yeah, and right. she outlived him. So that was rather interesting. Um, when you say thinking that she was ill, he basically was suggesting or accusing her that her illnesses were all in her head? Well, I think so. Fibromyalgia is a hard mm. thing to diagnose and it wasn't well known in, in the days mm. that mum had it. Uh, and that's another cruel aspect of some of these diseases that you, you don't actually see them. You don't have spots, you don't limp, you know, you're not mm. doing something that, that shows that you're as ill as you are. Yeah, mm. and so sometimes it's it's quite misunderstood. Yeah, uh, so that that was a struggle that Mum also had to face mm. in that way. But you know, that the Lord gave Mum and Dad a ministry to people who had struggled with 
uh, different things in their lives, mm. different tragedies. Uh, so together, mum and dad actually um, endured lots of family trials. And I guess the most impactful of those was the, the death of my brother mm. at the age of 19. Wow. Uh, he was in a car crash with a drunk driver who ran into his car. And John lived for a month uh, in hospital before he died. So, but he lived in a way that you couldn't communicate with him um, on a whole lot of apparatus. Mm. Uh, so that was tough. And then uh, within the same year, mm. uh, eight months later, I had uh, a major car accident where I was in a convertible and we went off the road. Uh, I was hit by a fence post mm. and uh, barbed wire and ironically ended up in the same ward of a hospital, the same sister on duty as my brother mm. had had months before. So uh, that, that must was, have been incredibly scary for your parents to come and visit you. Absolutely. It was easy for me, Mark, because mm. I was asleep most of the time during mm. that time. Uh, it was mum and dad that had that struggle. Mm. Um, I was in an induced coma for two weeks and in intensive care for quite some time and uh, mm. in hospital for, for months. Uh, getting so, over that. I mean, your family's seen incredible trial and suffering and loss. Sure. Um, can you talk about something of your parents' faith? Like, did, you know, did they ever question God? Did they ever doubt God? Did you, you know, how did they respond to all of these trials? Well, they had a great saying that I remember vividly during John's um, death and, and, uh, and it was, uh, our God is too kind to be cruel and too wise to ever make a mistake. And I think that was something that really struck with us that to keep that in mind and uh, not to think that you were being hard done by uh, by God but that there was a reason behind whatever you were going through and so that was their faith was really strong and they were able to share that with others who had gone through similar things um, in their in their uh, yeah, your parents' Life. faith reminds me of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 1 about praise be to the God of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts yeah, us in all sure. of our sorrows so that yeah. we can comfort others, others. with mm. the comfort that we ourselves have received. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that was very true of your... Absolutely. Your... That's a great verse for mum and dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really sums them up terrifically. Mm. Mm. Um, now, this is not a trite pietistic statement that they're relaying to you either because no, you know they, they themselves mm. have gone through mm. immense suffering mm -hmm. um you mentioned earlier about the selflessness of your dad mm -hmm. How, what did that look like in caring for your mum as she went through you know 17 operations and you've still got a young sure. family yeah what did it look like on a day-to-day -day basis still being a pastor and working but also caring for his family what sort of model did you see there yeah. Oh, look, um, I have to be honest with you. Uh, after my car accident, I don't remember much of my childhood. Wow. I don't even remember my brother mm. because he died eight months before my accident. So I don't actually remember much about John. Um, so it's like your so, memory had just been wiped. Yeah, mm. to some degree. And even now, I have the memory of about six to nine months so I'm a bit like a goldfish. Mm. <laughs> now that can have great positives, Mark. Mm. You, you could ask Andrew. I forget things. That's yeah. That's... So I was going to ask, who are you married to again? <laughs> <laughs> I keep practicing. Lucky he's around on a on a daily basis, yeah. so I keep practicing yeah. his name. So that's all right. Um, but yeah, there are positives to not remembering things, uh, but there are also mm. negatives, of course. And you and you've just got to adjust. Mm. So. Um, so that's a hard thing. So some of those questions that you asked me, I probably won't be able to answer completely. Mm. But I, I do remember my overall memory of dad is his selflessness and his willingness to get involved in other people's lives. But at the same time, have a real balance in that we never felt like we were left behind mm. by dad in, in his role as a pastor. Mm. Um, he always had that happy balance of, of family life as well as 
uh, the pastorate. So yeah. I probably can't answer well, in, it's okay. in I, I mean, detail. I was talking one. to one of our elders just last night, actually, at our session meeting, and he made the comment, and I thought it was very apt, that children learn so much through modelling. Yeah. And, you know, what sort of legacy do you feel like your parents left you in that regard? Yeah, I, th I think that um, the the aspect of mum's endurance and uh, and dad's selflessness uh, would be two things that that really stand out to me and realizing that the Lord puts you in situations for a reason mm. uh, and not to question that mm. uh, sometimes that's easier said than done mm. uh, and you've got to uh, pull yourself up and say remember Heather you yeah. know, that, <laughs> yeah. that that our God's too kind to be cruel and too wise to make a mistake yeah mm. remember that mm. yeah um, and I think that's that's an important thing I hope that answers your question yeah no it's a great yeah. statement it'd be great to have that up on the wall wouldn't it <laughs> a, yeah I've a... got it in the wall here uh, yeah good you haven't <laughs> forgotten that one no, I haven't forgotten that one yeah. um another question I had it was you know they okay they've cared for each other they've cared for you um through a lot of suffering and yet they themselves towards the end of their life um, mm -hmm. suffered pretty significant but different forms of dementia. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what was their trial that they, they went through at the end of their life and what did that mean for you sure. caring for them? Yeah. Uh, mum actually got – mum died first, so we'll go into mum first. Uh, mum actually got Parkinson's disease mm. uh, probably about 15 years before she died. And that, for her, led into Lewy body dementia. Now, Lewy body is different from other forms of dementia in that you do lose your memory, but you also gain an incredible imagination. Mm. So you start seeing things around you uh, because of these what they call Lewy bodies that, that clog up your brain, for want of a better term. This mm. is very technical, you can tell <laughs> my description. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes if you need any explanation. Mm. Yeah, um, that mum would see things like a cat in the room with her or she'd turn and have a conversation with my sister who wasn't there mm. uh, or she'd get up in the middle of the night to make hot chocolate for her grandchildren who had arrived at 2 a.m., uh, mm. that sort of thing. So we had to turn off the electricity during the night uh, so that mum couldn't accidentally put a saucepan on and have mm. it boil yeah. you know, there all night long. Yeah. Um, so there were lots of things that, that mum did. And I understand and she's saw. living with you at that point. Right? No, she wasn't living no. with us. She was actually living with dad because okay. she actually died a year before dad got dementia. Right. So she was living with dad and I was actually... Uh, and Andrew were both uh, assisting dad. So we were sort mm. of part-time carers, whereas dad was the primary carer yep. and still a pastor at that stage mm. in his life. He actually ended up being a pastor for 62 years. Wow. So you've it's got to be something some, to live up to it's there, got to Mark. be some kind of record. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think he's one of the longest serving pastors in Australian Baptist history. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, that's... Um, Quite, a, quite an achievement all on its own. Yeah. Um, so, so we decided, uh, Dad and Andrew and I, decided to enter Mum's world rather than say to her, mm. what, you know, there's no cat there uh, or there's, mm. there's no neighbour swinging from a tree, chainsawing the tree because the next day the tree still looks the same. Mm. And the one classic illustration was Mum saw the QE2 coming up the cement driveway mm. of her villas and uh, of course you know said oh look there's the QE2 mm. and so rather than saying are you kidding you know, how can a QE2 come up a cement driveway we decided to enter her world so that she wouldn't clam up and okay. not talk anymore thinking why am I seeing these things and no one else is seeing them? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we decided to enter her world. And so I opened the curtains and said, mm. what can you see, mum? And she said, uh, oh, can you see the, can you see the, the little girl on the second um, mm. row up? Yeah. yeah. She's waving at us. So we're mm. there waving out the window. Now, yeah. the neighbours might have thought we were 
particularly friendly that day, yeah. but you know, that didn't matter. Mum kept talking and, mm. and kept relating to us. And I think that's a big thing to remember, to try and enter their world and make them still feel comfortable. Mm. Otherwise, the world would become quite frightening for them. Yeah, yeah. and I could imagine they could even get quite well, anxious and even angry. Yeah, well, yes. Mm. Um, change of character happens quite often with dementia, but mm. that's that wasn't mum's case with Louis Body. Mm. Uh, so getting on to dad, dad mm. actually had well, that. Well, just before we do, oh, sorry. A, yep, sure. I, 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 could, I know, I'm speaking from a personal point of view, we've had relatives ourselves, Angie and I, where they've had dementia and they will deny certain things like their spouse has died. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. and we've had to wrestle with, do you tell the truth? And sure. um, actually go, well, actually, you know what's happened to them. And then allow them to feel sad again uh, and to mm -hmm. feel the weight of that. But I, I can understand in your situation, it's a wisdom call because mm -hmm. there's – uh, without going into all the scientific detail, uh, there's stuff like clogging up the brain, sure. you know, which yeah, is yeah. actually making them see things. And so to stop them clamming up, you need to enter that. Yeah. But I could imagine there's other times where you need to challenge reality and say, no, this is true. Oh, uh, that's, well, that's not true. Um, so, it, yeah, it's a wisdom thing at that point. I think so, Mark. I actually had the experience of saying to mum, when she first started falling into this and seeing seeing things, was the neighbour hanging from the tree with a chainsaw yeah. lopping down the tree. And I turned to mum and said, but mum, that can't be mm. because the tree's always the same. And the look of horror on a face mm. made me go to dad and say, how should we okay. handle this? Yeah, yeah, and and rather than put her through that trauma, because she couldn't get over the fact that she yeah. could see something, and I couldn't. So it was your dad so, that suggested, yeah, enter into her world. Yeah, and, because right. it was just so distressing for mm, her. Yeah. and I thought uh, then the Lord gave me great wisdom beyond what I normally do, in that uh, things like Mum would say, "Oh, there's a policeman at the door." Mm. And I'd say, oh, mum, isn't that wonderful? Mm. No one else in this villa complex has guards at their door. Yeah. You do. Isn't yeah. that wonderful? So, and that made her relax then mm. and not be uh, so fearful. Yeah, I, I know. Um, and what we're talking about today really is, yeah. I, I think there's a beautiful expression I've heard you use often, that it's the heavy privilege you know, uh, of caring sure, for elderly parents. Sure. Everybody's going to have that in a different expression. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've met friends that are caring for elderly parents with dementia who are aggressive physically and yeah. violent. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine having to deal with that kind of... Neither can I, Mark. That's a, that's a, unfortunately, dementia is a very individual thing. Mm. And so you can talk generally about things, but... Uh, people are very individual in how they react uh, within their dementia. And that's often, uh, this is a generalisation, but it's often uh, Alzheimer's disease that will bring on uh, that change of character as mm. such. Uh, dementia gives a, generally gives a lack of personality and you become this sort of cardboard cutout of what you used to be. Yeah, well, um, that's like your dad, isn't it? Because yeah, your yeah, mum had one form of dementia yeah. where she was seeing things and almost became more animated. Yeah. Uh, but your dad, can you explain? Well, more animated within her thoughts, mm. certainly not more animated in her persona, Yeah, mm. sort of, yeah. and her uh, ability to move around and that sort of stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so your dad, yep. explain... How did his dementia, what form did it take? Yeah, Dad was actually, had just finished a sermon at church and had a roaring Irish um, mm. sort of um, accent and voice. So he was halfway through the, the last hymn when suddenly he stopped singing and slumped to the floor in mm. church. Uh, and thankfully, there was a theatre nurse who occasionally got to come to his church because she was on duty a lot. That particular week, she was there and she was in the, the, mm. the uh, pew and ran to the front 
to aid dad and called an ambulance. And the long story after that was that he had a triple bypass. But unfortunately, the evening of the triple bypass, he leaked. So within 12 hours, they had to reopen him, find the leak, seal it and and, uh, close him up again. So his plumbing was fine then. But about a week later, his electrical system went berserk in his heart and he had to have a pacemaker put in. And as a result of that, he actually got vascular dementia. Uh, Now, vascular dementia is basically just cutting off um, blood to your brain and Mm. oxygen and things like that, the things that help it to work. Mm. Um, So dad actually developed dementia from having those anaesthetics and 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 how old was he then? Oh, good question. Um, I think he would have been about 86, 87, somewhere around there. 86, I think. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. because he was 93 when he passed away seven years later. Okay, so how can you explain? So your your mother's had dementia and died? Yes. And then? And then there was about 12 months Mm. where Dad and I renovated his church with... Uh, a team of people that helped us mm. <laughs> uh, to keep Dad occupied yep. um, after, and his church was you know, mm. quite uh, uh, ramshackled. Basically, um, because when, also he was 86 and getting lazy. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, of course, yes. Uh, we actually, Andrew and I went down to Jindabyne for a holiday for a yeah. short time, came back and found that Dad had been up on a ladder uh, painting a church hall while mm. we were away. <laughs> Said right. to him, Dad... You're, you know, you're, you're grounded, you're, literally. You're, absolutely. And I said, you know, you could have fallen here and no one would have heard you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he said, oh, no need to worry. The Lord's with me. Mm. And, you know, that was his answer to me. I thought, okay. But with vascular dementia, can you explain what was that like for him? And mm. what did that mean for you and Andrew, your husband, in caring sure, for him? Sure. It was a big change for dad because he actually went from having a photographic memory to having almost no memory at all. Mm. He didn't know me towards the end of his life. He didn't know who I was, Um, but he still answered to dad for some strange reason. (laughs) Mm. And, uh, uh, but it must have been an an enormous change for him. Uh, Mum, I know this sounds awful, but mum was used to being ill as awful as that sounds, but dad wasn't. So uh, it was a a sudden and enormous change for him. And look, Andrew was a fantastic help um, to have around uh, Mm. and embrace mum and dad as his own. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a a really interesting point you make. I mean, I know your husband well, right? And (laughs) he's he's a very helpful person. Some would say too helpful. (laughs) When we, we so prepared, you know, whenever we do something, he's got everything there. That's just amazing, right? Yeah, yeah. But it is amazing. That's an ama- that's, um, that amazing, helpful attitude, though, is, is incredible. But it, I could imagine it puts a special or could, at least, put a special strain on a marriage, particularly in caring for another person's or another spouse's parents. Sure. And I'm sure that can happen, but it certainly didn't happen in our case. Um, Andrew embraced having dad live with us mm. and, and he did for seven years uh, before the Lord took him home. Mm. So he was with us qu- for quite a long time uh, and gradually declining in his mental health through that time and his just physical abilities mm. like um, being able to walk around, being able to swallow and chew, mm. um, you know, things that you would think are are just we take for granted Mm. Uh, but as dementia develops uh, it certainly uh, goes into those areas of your life so can I ask a personal question at this point like okay you're giving out to your parents you're you're honoring them which is still a biblical command till the end although it takes different forms Um, how do you care for each other uh, as as husband and wife, yeah, and keep I guess some boundaries of knowing that okay, you're still my priority here, even though sure. I'm caring for a parent. Yeah, how did you navigate that? Well, we actually allowed Dad to be on his own when he was able to be, mm. so that allowed us to be on our own too mm. um, within the house, and and that was a good thing 
Um, you know, you, you didn't have to have Dad with you 24-7 mm. um, in, in that way. Mm. Uh, he was close enough to be able to know what was happening for him without actually always having to be there. Mm. Uh, we also slept upstairs, which... Uh, so it gave some physical boundary. Yeah, gave yeah. some physical boundary. Uh, uh, it was a great help to me when I found that I could get some help from uh, like Anglicare and mm. uh, government uh, people to turn to uh, that actually told me about a mat that you could put on the floor mm. beside Dad's bed mm. so that he it would tell me when he's getting up during the night. Otherwise, I would sleep with sort of one eye open and mm. listening out. Uh, if and he, then sleep deprivation is a particular form of trauma. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. It certainly is, mm. yeah. And when it goes on for years and years, because it was probably only the last couple of years of Dad being with us that I found out about that, Matt. So for probably about the first five years of Dad being there. Would it uh, have made a big difference if you had have known earlier? I think it might have mm. given a few less wrinkles, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Uh, now, I joke before about how helpful Andrew is because he is incredibly helpful, right? Yes. And I these are the good not. works that God has put before you both. Sure. But I can imagine too, and I know there are other circumstances where people go, this is now beyond us. We, we can't lift them anymore to sure. care. Um, did you ever get to that point where you thought, um, and what advice do you have for people that at when you reach that point of going, well, now they actually need care in a home. Yeah, we had to reach that point with mum and dad. Mm. Um, we got a phone call with mum from dad that um, mum was too stiff to move anymore. Mm. And so we knew then, um, now is the time that she mm. has to go into care. We were trying to keep her at home for as long as possible but um, that just wasn't a possibility in the end. So she had to go into care for 11 months uh, before the Lord took her home. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the people in the nursing home were too run off their feet to take care of mum because basically she had to be fed over a long period of time. So even though they could give her breakfast, it was up to Dad and I to go and watch and, and help her with uh, lunch and tea. So that was a daily responsibility? It was a daily responsibility mm. for 11 months, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that was a... Now, we're talking, I think, we rather aptly about the heavy privilege. And it and it's it's a lovely expression because it's it's both are true. And oh. it seems paradoxical. Can yes. you explain the paradox here? Oh, look... How is it heavy? Yeah. And how is it a privilege? Oh, it's definitely a privilege. Taking care of people who... Um, are at that end of their life or uh, are a child with special needs or, you know, some form of um, ministry like that is definitely, definitely a privilege. And the Lord blesses you through it. Uh, but it also is not a light thing to do. Mm. It also uh, comes with a toll yeah. on you personally mm. uh, and sometimes on your looks and your features <laughs> um, and sometimes just on your emotions because you're watching someone that you love deeply just fade away the long, slow goodbye. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it can be um, a toll. How did you uh, process that grief, Heather? Yeah, look, I, I think I remembered that... that um, God's put me in this position. It's a privilege for me to do this. And I'm only giving back to them what they spent their lives doing for me. Mm. And so that's, that's where I came from with that, Mark, that mm. the Lord had given me that as a gift and that I shouldn't uh, turn it down mm. or run away from it. Now, it's interesting because you've spent a lot of time caring for your parents mm. and now you're in a new season in life. You've come to Tassie, we're, you know. We're in our honeymoon stage. I, yeah. I know. It's been a long honeymoon, it seems. Every time I talk to you, um, you're talking about how wonderful Tasmania is and I have to keep reminding, particularly your husband, that heaven is going to be better. Um, but you live in yeah, the yeah. Huon Valley, right. which is 
pretty well parallel to the Garden of Eden. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it seems like really the Lord has really honoured you um, in terms of caring for your parents. And now you are more freed up and you are sure. enjoying some of the things that you weren't able to do when you were caring for parents. Do you, how do you see the Lord's hand in all of that? Is that an accurate way of looking at it, do you oh, think? Oh, absolutely. And look, we've almost made it through our first winter. Yes. Mm. So that that's a, that's a great thing. But yeah, uh, look, I, I personally really believe that the Lord blesses you so that you can be a blessing to others. Mm. The Lord answers your prayers so that you can be used to be an answer to the prayers of others. So I think in setting up Bindawalla, which we have done, mm. uh, Andrew and I have moved from Sydney, or the Lord moved us. He opened the door and pushed us through mm. quite quickly, actually, mm. uh, down to the Huon, uh, which we absolutely love. Mm. Uh, it's a beautiful place to be, as you well know. Mm. Uh, and uh, we, the Lord led us to a house there that, that we can actually cut off uh, about a third of it mm. and it becomes a private retreat for people who are feeling burnt out uh, from caring for others like ministers and missionaries and chaplains and yeah. and people who have been in our own situation. Yeah, carers that are looking for respite, right? Sure, mm. yeah. So another quote I've heard from your parents that you've said is, if the Lord opens a door of blessing, you should try to... <laughs> Drag bring someone or else through. Bring everybody else <laughs> through as many Absolutely. as you can through as well. It seems yeah. to be that's really what you're trying to do at Bindawalla. Yep. Can you explain? It's not just a house; it's it's a property, right? Yeah. In the Huon. Sure. Can you explain um, what you've done uh, a little bit, what it's like, um, and how people might benefit, particularly if they're feeling burnt out? Tired? Yeah. Look, it's it's a beautiful property. It's three point eight acres, so it's not mm. huge, uh, but it is. Uh, s nestled, I'll sta start sounding like a real estate agent here, it's nestled underneath Sleeping Beauty, mm -hmm. so uh, which is a, a mountain range. And that just changes all through the day. The light and shade on that is just magical. And there's just something very peaceful about being in, in that particular countryside. And it just focuses your attention on the Lord and the, our creator. It's just a, a wonderful place to be. Mm. And so we are not only grateful for ourselves being there, we pinch mm. ourselves constantly that, that the Lord has placed us in such a you know, traumatic situation. No, yeah, it's uh, a tough ministry, but someone's got to do somebody's it. Somebody's right? got to do it. Yes, that's right. So uh, we thought that if we get so much out of this, we would love to be able to bring others into the refreshing atmosphere of being in the countryside. Yeah, your your house is a really interestingly designed house. It it's is. Like it's, it's like it's got two wings. It's a know. boomerang, yeah. basically. So it deserves an Aboriginal name like Bindawalla, yeah. which means happy home. Okay. Um, and there's two stories behind Bindawalla. Apparently, Dad got confused. He thought it was originally a nursing home name. Right. which was very funny when we were in our 30s and he gave us the name for our home in Sydney, uh, but mm. not so funny now that we're in our 60s <laughs> and, and probably a little closer to yeah. <laughs> nursing homes. Uh, but it, it is a lovely name and we just thought it was appropriate to name it after what Dad mm. had given us. Mm. So, yeah, it's shaped like a boomerang and we only really need the middle section and one side. Mm -hmm. we, we don't, we found that we don't need one entire mm. section and that we can actually close that off so it's completely private for people. Mm. They don't have to have anything to do with us if mm -hmm. they don't want to. Mm -hmm. They can just come and be themselves do whatever they want to do to relax. Mm. But we're also set, uh, in a setting that is just beautiful and it's not far from some great features yeah. of the Huon and Tasmania as a whole. And the prop, uh, the retreat centre itself is fully contained? Yeah, yeah. It's mm. all, all set up. You've got your own bathroom, your own bedroom for two people maximum. Mm. Um, 
and also a fully contained kitchen. Yeah, we should so. say that and clarify because it's not for families. It's no, respite not necessarily. Or care for a, a, an individual or a couple. That's right. And for those from the mainland that are topographically challenged, yes. where is the Huon Valley in relation to Hobart oh, okay. and the airport? And... Uh, yeah, it's about 45 minutes from the airport mm. and about 30 minutes from Hobart. It's south, southwest. Of Hobart, okay. So uh, and along the Huon uh, River, right. So, um, so people are going near to Huonville, need. If okay. Yeah. Uh, people are going to need a car uh, yes. when they come down, so yeah. they have to factor that in whether you hire it at the airport or sure. come down on the Spirit if you're really adventurous. Yeah. Yes. Which is a great especially trip, especially the last couple of weeks. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not advisable during spring. Yes. Uh, but definitely during <laughs> summer. Yeah. If people want to book or make a reservation, how do they do that? We've set up a website, mm. uh, bindawalla.com.au, mm. uh, and people can uh, look at that. I'm sure Andrew will give you the info for that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, they okay. can just give us a buzz and come on down. So it feels like your whole life sort of come full circle in a way. Like it's bookended with, you know, caring for parents and now caring for carers that are caring for parents or maybe a child sure. with a disability yeah. uh, that just need a weekend away. Yeah. Um, it's or very week, doable. Or, or a fortnight. Yeah. yeah that's, that's up to their availability. My, my, yeah. my wife, Angie, often goes back every couple of months to look after her elderly mother who's in a nursing home now with uh, dementia. Mm. And we marvel at how quick the plane is. It's like an hour and a half back yeah, to Sydney. Yeah, it's nothing, is it really? Basically, yeah. you put on some music and then you're there. You're there, yeah. Um, so it is very doable. Yeah. Um, but, they, but people can look it up. Uh, on the website pindawalla.com. Yep. And uh, all the re re reservation, all the details. Sure. Uh, the calendar's all there. It's yes. pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, final question. Any, any final words of encouragement for people that are listening to this and are really in the midst of just feeling that heavy privilege of yeah. caring for someone they love? Mm. I know I've been there. I'm with you. Uh, it, it is a tough gig. It, uh, and it's um, often uh, underrated, unfortunately. It's, it can be quite lonely uh, to take care of people. And, that, and that's something that uh, they should be reaching out to their church mm. um, and involve their church as much as they can in just prayer support. Mm -hmm. And those people that are at, in a church and know of someone who's a carer, please reach out to them. Mm. Please um, keep in contact with them and even drop around for a cuppa or something with them and let them just, you be the sounding board, mm. let them talk to you. Uh, because you often find that even though you love the person that you're with, mm. you know, they can't talk to you as they used to. Um, and that, that can be a tough thing over time. Uh, mm. So, yes, it's important. And also to prioritise your time with the Lord. You can, you can reach out to other organisations and things for support, mm. but the best support you have is your walk with God. Mm. And so not to underrate that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good piece of advice, I think, a good word, because in caring for others, it's so easy to neglect your time with God sure. in prayer and in his word mm -hmm. because you've, you've just so... Flat out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And the devil will always get you when you're at your weakest. Mm. So he's, he's a dirty player, as my dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. Well, look... So. Uh, Good on you for, oh, I shouldn't say that, that's no. quite faithless. <laughs> God bless you for what, Thanks, what you're Mark. doing and, um, yeah. and being seeking to care for those that are caring for others. And I hope that Bindawalla is a great blessing to oh, many. We do too. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. Mm. Um, and look, if you're thinking about uh, respite, I'd highly recommend uh, what Andrew and Heather have set up. They're great people. Uh, really accommodating and uh, have set up a really beautiful location. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us. Thank you. My privilege. Well, this has been Mark Powell for AP's Profiles in Christian Living. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this latest episode. I'll make sure that all of the uh, details for Bindawalla are part of the show notes so that you can easily find it. And I look forward to seeing you next time.